Oh yeah. <laughs> The very first thing that she said to us, or said to me, was, I quit and I will, I'm willing to tell you whatever you want to know. Mm -hmm. and That's before any offer. Before that any offer. That mm -hmm. was before I, it took her several attempts to reach me because I'm, we're not friends and I didn't see the message come across. And so she's, she reiterated it and I, I thought, well, great, you know, mm -hmm. we can at least meet and it'll give me an opportunity to find out where she's at and share the gospel with her. Right. So Kim and I took her out to lunch on Tuesday of last week and, um, you know, sat with her for like an hour and a half while she just told us details about what was happening there. Very helpful information for us to have. Mm. But I knew Marcus was coming to town, mm -hmm. so I'm like, this is providential. Right. Maybe she'll agree to it. I didn't really know that she would, but she did agree to it. We don't believe that she was saved or that she quit because of she's against abortion, but you and the group that you're with decide to help her out. Uh, well, I used to work at Whole Women's Health, Fort Worth. Um, ended up leaving due to the fact that, well, there's a lot of reasons why, but <laughs> the straw that broke the camel's back was, made me pick between my small child versus them, is basically what it came down to, and I chose child. So <laughs> they didn't win that battle. They were increasing the hours. They were becoming increasingly more, before they were more, I guess more accommodating would be the best word to use, more accommodating to people's schedules and people that have kids versus the ones that didn't because they could do whatever they wanted to. Mm -hmm. And it got to the point where if the accommodations just stopped, they wouldn't even listen to them, just said no. And, uh, and it came down to, well, you can pick your kid or us. Right. So I'm like, well, kid wins. <laughs> right. But I got the impression from the interview that she did not quit out of an opposition to abortion. I think she's been on the on the wire, on the line with it. But I, you know, I think in the interview it came out that she wasn't really opposed to it. But uh, so I believe that she quit for practical reasons. So with the increasing hours, the reason behind that is more patience. More patience. Mm-hmm. So they can fit in more people within their certain time lot. Because they were seeing so many people at, during one time, well, hey, if we open up more slots, we can see even more people. And people that maybe have to go to work, but they can't come in at like four o'clock in the afternoon, two o'clock in the afternoon, whatever it may be. So if we open them up after six, at like, you know, six or seven, and we, ha we, we start seeing patients maybe about 7.40, stop having them scheduled at 7.40, 7.30, then we can see more people and squeeze more people even in. Yeah. She did share with us some information that I think would be helpful. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that uh, we don't know because we're never in there, but she said that, that uh, the people inside can hear every word that you're saying when you're preaching, especially on the amplification. Depending on how, uh, depending on where someone was. So if you were on the, if you were facing the building, if you were on the left hand side of the building, we could hear you pretty well. That's very helpful when we're out there with an amplifier and we can say, hey, if you're there right now, you know, you need to get out of there. And we can speak more directly to that situation. Very helpful. Are there women who, like, are upset because they know they're killing their child? Do you think there's women in there that don't know it's a child? About a 50-50 on that one. Um, I think some of them, maybe they're in denial, maybe. would be probably the best way to put it, is denial about it. Um, and then uh, there's some in there that come in, like they've been there several times. <laughs> and they know exactly what they're doing. They know exactly what's going on. And they're like, okay, just get it done. I don't care. I was, I, was kinda, I was always on the fence with it. Uh, I think I reconciled it a little bit because I didn't actually go in the room rooms when they were doing anything. So I think that's kind of how I, you know, played it out in my head. Because I, I was like, I was either working in the front office doing paperwork, like, you know, I'm just looking at a bunch of paper all day. Or I'm just taking some vitals here and there or doing this, this, and like maybe drawing some blood. Other than that, I wasn't having anything really to inadvertently with it. What I thought was interesting too is that they insulate the staff from that. There's only very few people who get to see the gruesome part of it. And uh, I think that's to insulate them for what they're actually doing. Although they know it, but I think it, you know, it makes it even more real to them when they see that. What you're bringing to light here is that they're not treated. 
They're treating the patients badly. They're treating their own staff badly. Yeah, they're just trying to get people in and out, like as quickly because as money. possible. Mm -hmm. It's all money. Yeah, because if they can get them in and out, especially then they also push the surgical. They push that one more. Yeah, because they make more money. Well, it's not even that they make more money, uh, especially when like they're like, say someone's seven weeks, right? They're not gonna make more money off someone doing surgical versus the medication. Mm -hmm. They're not gonna, because they're the same price. Okay. They're the exact same price. So no matter which way you flipped it, they're the exact same. And uh, they, they push the surgical because apparently there's like a quota he has to meet for the surgicals themselves. Not so much the uh, medication, but for the surgical. Why? I'm not sure why. I never was told why. I just was told that we really need to push surgicals or whatever because of... Well, that would be, that's where I would wonder about uh, the whole selling stuff. Wait, what do they do with the, the, the remains? They take it to the bathroom. There's a dirty path and a, a clean path. So she takes the jar and dumps it into that little, like a little, is that really like a colander? It's like one of those things you kind of like, almost like pull out of something from a deep fryer. <laughs> And the best way I can describe it, it's kind of like that uh, metal wiry mesh kind of deal. And then they rinse it out. And then I know that from there, they end up dumping it onto a light table that you'd use for drawing. And then they'd put it on there to make sure. And sometimes the doctor would actually ask to verify. I'm not sure exactly. To verify they got everything. Yeah. He would, have, he would come in and like, okay. And like, yeah, I guess he would like a little once over. And then, okay. And then that from there, I know uh, they would put it in a biohazard bag of some kind, because I've seen the biohazard bag, um, and then put it in the freezer. And then it sits in the freezer till whoever it is that comes to pick it up. And one time that freezer actually went out. And that was horrible. <laughs> we ended up having to buy a new freezer and have it sent in. Like she literally went to like Costco or something and bought like another small, because it's not very big, it's about, yay wide freezer and about fast tall of the table. So it's not it's not a very large freezer they keep in there. When it goes out, obviously it stinks in there. Yeah. Like, yeah, whenever you would open that dirty path door, it was bad. It was really, really bad. Just the door to the room. Yeah. Because that room was sealed pretty well in the first place. So it was only, you only got smelt it whenever someone had to open that door. I could just imagine that, you know, the, the feeling inside that these babies that they had murdered were going to start to stink and that there's a bit of a panic for them to get another freezer. I thought that was uh, really telling of what goes on there. Very telling. It's the, it's the reality that, uh, of bloodshed and murder that's taking. It's the evidence. Based on what she was saying, it really kind of matches up with the David Daleiden videos that keep, keeping those remains in the freezer, what other purpose would there be for the quotas, right? It's just it's horrific, right? I mean, imagine you, you're trying to make sure you've got all the pieces of a dead baby. New at noon, an important appeals court ruling on the Texas law requiring doctors to perform abortions to show sonograms to patients. Now, federal appeals court in New Orleans says that Texas can enforce the law. With the sonograms, what are they showing the women? What do they show them? Um, they, they only show them if they ask. Okay. So if they ask, then they show. Like, and I had a couple of patients, you know, that came in, and they asked me, like, can I see it? I'm like, yeah, just, you know, that's fine. You can see it. Like, no one's, like, I'm not going to stop you from seeing it. If you want to see it, just tell them, like, hey, I really, like, make, I, like, I'll tell her in the hallway, like, make sure that she's aware that you already want to see it. And, uh, like, I would do that at least. I know other people probably wouldn't have done it, but I would be like, okay, well, hey, this patient in room one wants to be able to see the sauna. Just heads up. And, uh, and they're like, oh, okay. And then, but if they don't want, if no one tells them beforehand or they don't tell them, they won't see it, they won't show it. Okay, well, the fetal Doppler, since our sono machines don't do anything with that because they're old. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're a little, well, one's a little newer, one's a little older, but they don't have that capability of like sound. So they don't have that sound capability. And uh, I don't know if that was by coincidence or what. Um, but the fetal dots, so they have to have, since the sauna machines don't do that, they have to have the fetal Dopplers in each room that they have procedures um, in order to, if say that they want to hear the heartbeat, they'll be able to hear a heartbeat. I've never, they're still in the box as far as I, last time I checked because I have never seen anyone busted out of the box, like brand spanking new. Mm. <laughs>
like brand new, still in the box. Still, I think it still has like the paper stuff like wrapped around. <laughs> well, what you're seeing there in that interview is what we said in Babies Are Still Murdered here, that the, the industry, the abortion industry, can, they don't have to follow these pro-life regulations. There's loopholes. Mm -hmm. and, and this is just proof of what we were talking about there, that these pro-life regulations uh, will not, they're unenforceable, <laughs> completely unenforceable. They do what they want with, the, with those loopholes to fit what they're trying to do, make money. And again, there's no one that's really standing over his shoulder, yeah. making sure the Texas state law regarding... Well, that's should, the, who's supposed to be doing it is the clinic manager, but she's, I don't know, she's going doing whatever, so... <laughs> okay, she, but she doesn't, so she's normally not doing that. Yeah, she's normally either running around like a chicken with her head cut off, right? or she's not even there, or she's just hanging out in her office talking to one of the other managers, mm -hmm. and yeah. So that's not happening from the office manager standpoint? Oh, yeah. So, yeah, okay. Even though these types of clinics are the enemy, I mean, we as Christians have to be fair to them. This was one woman. One we, woman. We didn't have a corroborating testimony from no. her. So we believe that she has no reason to lie. Right. And what she says might not have been accurate. I mean, I trust what right. she said, but we have to keep in mind that this is uncorroborated testimony, and yeah. we have to give them that benefit as Christians, even though they are the enemy. A few months ago, I remember women coming out of the clinic limping really dramatically. It looked like probably they had torn a torn uterus. A bit from just, you know, having been out in front of clinics for right. a long time. Just observing and knowing what happens. So um, do you know of that happening often there? Is that No, okay. uh, it's only happened once and uh, we, uh, like the one, t one time since I was there. Okay. That, and that was because a patient was not listening and they were trying to like, like you need to be still, like, you know, we don't want to like do anything to hurt you. We need you to be still because there's something sharp and stuff mm -hmm. like that. Like you got to be still. Okay. And uh, she just kept wiggling and everything. Mm -hmm. And there, and he's like, well, I think I, I think I just ruptured her uterus because she just wiggled. Like she literally turned one way and then flipped again really fast. Mm -hmm. And he's like, and so he's like, well, okay. <laughs> I think that, that just happened because okay. she won't be still. So, and then, but the funny thing about that is they only have to, uh, I guess, a file a report of some kind if uh, he knows for a fact he did it. But if he suspects he did it, they don't have to file a report. So they, on that one, they suspected. He said, I suspect I did because of the way she was moving. He's like, I, and the way she started bleeding, I suspect that I might have. So, that, and then, you know, call ambulance and all that, get her out of there, go get her looked at. file a report. Yeah, as long as he suspects. If he does, unless he knows, knows, then they have to file a report. But if he says he suspects it, then they don't have to. So there's a loophole built in for mm -hmm. them so they can dodge it? Pretty much. Okay. Another loophole. <laughs> okay. One thing that struck me with interviewing Amanda as well is that if it's not a gospel proclamation, I mean, we're thrilled that she quit her job. Mm -hmm. But if she doesn't repent and put her trust in Jesus Christ, she is no closer to heaven for quitting her job. So our, our goal is not to get women to quit their jobs. Right. It's not to get women to stop killing their babies. Ultimately, we, we want that, but we want it because we want them to be saved. Because if they don't kill their baby for pragmatic or practical reasons, or they quit for practical reasons, they're still going to hell. Right. So that's why I, you, know, you as well believe that we go to the clinics to share the gospel with them, because it's a target-rich environment of unbelievers. Right. Because I, I don't believe a true believer would go there and, and kill their child. Yeah. All we will do from here on out is just continue to minister to her needs and continue to um, you know, present the gospel to her. My experience before I came to Christ, I was a pastor for about 12 years. And when I realized I wasn't even saved, but I was pastoring, I was preaching every Sunday, right. doing all that. And then God revealed through his word that, you know, I was a hypocrite because I was doing one thing, saying one thing, you yeah. know, and doing completely different. And so, you know, my concern about anyone that's there, and that would obviously, I'm including you, I'm be direct, uh, you know, it'd be that, do you really know Christ? You know, knowing him changes us to a degree that, man, we wouldn't even want to be a part of it. And I understand, like, coming out of college you're looking for work and it's the job that opened up yeah it was literally 
boom, boom. Like, it was like, I got done with medical assisting school, what, like, uh, in February, I was there in March. Right. It was just boom, boom. Like, that's quick. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, the thing I encourage everybody in the Bible Belt is two questions. Number one, what is the gospel? Um, what's the content of the message? Well, obviously, Christ died for sinners. He rose from the dead. Our sins can be forgiven if we repent and place our faith in him. But then the second question I think is more important is what difference does that message make in our lives? And if there's no difference between us and like what is going on in the life of an unbeliever, it doesn't even, maybe an atheist or whatever, then we have reason to be concerned, you know? And so I say that to you out of concern for you, you know, that you know Christ and that ultimately one day that you, you're in his presence, you know, a, apart from, you know, all the garbage that we face in this life. Um, and so our desire is, you know, hopefully one day God will, you know, if we're, I don't know your heart, only God knows people's hearts, but, uh, you know, if you're not, if you haven't trusted Christ, that's our desire is to see that happen. We can't make that happen. Right. You know, <laughs> we don't do that whole walk the aisle, pray the prayer thing. You know, we believe if God's going to do something, he'll do it. So that's how we leave that. But yeah, and you know that we're, I've expressed this to you before, but we're available for whatever you need. You know, as you're looking for a job, we'll help you do that. Um, you know, try to help out where we can. Especially when we had these people coming in all the time, like literally they were here in February. And next thing you know, like that name looks familiar. Why does that name look familiar? And then all of a sudden you see it like, wait, oh, that's why it looks familiar. She was here in February and now she's back in April. And then, okay, she was here. Like, and then all of a sudden you see the same name again. Like, what is this? And, <laughs> and then it's like, it's June and she's back again. It's like, do you not understand what's happening here? <laughs> Yeah, once they're in path, they take the, so she takes the jar and dumps it into that little, like a little, is that really like a colander? It's like one of those things you kind of like, almost like pull out of something from a deep fryer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and the best way I can describe it is kind of like that uh, metal wiry mesh mm -hmm. kind of deal. And then they rinse it out. And then I know that from there, they end up dumping it onto a light table that you'd use for drawing. Have the uh, two like small, like, I guess it would be like a best way to describe a casserole dish, like clear casserole dishes, like really small ones. And then they put it on there to make sure. And sometimes the doctor would actually ask to verify. Uh, I don't, it was really sporadic if he did. It was like here, there, just, I guess, uh, sometimes if he wasn't sure, 
I'm not sure exactly. To verify they got everything? Yeah. Mm -hmm. He would have, he would come in like, okay, and like, yeah, I guess he had like a little once over and then, okay. And then that from there, I know uh, they would put it in a biohazard bag of some kind I've seen the biohazard bag mm -hmm. um, and then put it in the freezer. And then it sits in the freezer till whoever it is that comes to pick it up. 